Hello, welcome to the Weave user group. I hope you can hear and see me. Uh, my name is Tama Nakahara. I am uh, the DX community lead here at WeaveWorks. Today we have Luke Marsden who will be speaking. Awesome, okay, so uh, I'll get started because we have a lot of material to get through today. Um, I'm gonna talk both about Istio, which is a very exciting brand new project uh, from Google, IBM, and, uh, and some other partners, um, including WeaveWorks, and uh, then um, we will also be talking about container networking and security. Uh, let's let's dive straight in. Um, and I put an exclamation mark in the title because it's kind of exciting. Um, it's a brand new piece of technology that's been open sourced, like I said, by Google and IBM and, and some other and some other partners. Um, and it's always nice when you get cool new technology and you get to talk about it. And lots of people have been talking about it and uh, asking me if I can talk about it. So it's really nice to uh, to present a little bit about Istio, which is a service mesh. Um, but before I talk about Istio, just for 30 seconds, I'm going to talk about why I'm here and why we care. Um, so um, I work for a company called Weaveworks. Uh, Weaveworks develops a product called Weave Cloud. The idea with Weave Cloud is that it gets you around this loop faster. So if you have a development team who are building applications, then one of those things that those develop that development team needs to be able to do is ship features faster. And so we help get features around this loop as quickly as possible from ideas into code, into container images, and then via our deploy feature into your production cluster. And we also help you fix problems faster. Um, and so if you have a problem in production, you might want to be able to uh, understand it, visualize it, monitor it, um, and then turn that understanding of the problem into a code or configuration change that you can then ship back around the loop as quickly as possible. Um, the argument that we make is that uh, the competitiveness of a software team is a direct function of how fast you can go around this loop. And there's a couple of other logos that I've adorned uh, these slides with, and that's a Prometheus logo, uh, which is um, relevant to the Istio conversation. And there's also a WeaveNet logo, which is relevant to the security conversation. So uh, we'll come on to that um, in due course. So um, I'll jump straight into the Istio topic. Um, Istio is a service mesh, and in order to understand what a service mesh is, it's helpful to understand um, to start by thinking about what your application already does, or in particular, what an individual microservice um, of your application um, already does. And if you're building microservices, then uh, each component in, uh, in your application is almost certainly both a client and a server. Um, it's a client probably because it may well depend on other uh, microservices. And it's a server because it's providing a service. It's a microservice. It's providing a service to, uh, to other microservices or to your users, if it's the front end, um, uh, and, and so on. So, so this is a very common pattern that you have a microservice that has a, a server component and a client component. Um, and in the server component, you often need to secure that server component with TLS. And that means that you have to bake code into your application that knows about uh, TLS certificates and uh, CA certs and all of that stuff. Um, and that's uh, I've done that a few times. It's kind of annoying. You get used to it. But it's a shame to have to do that over and over again for every, uh, for every component. Then your API client uh, needs to have things like retries baked into it. It's simple stuff. But actually, getting retries right is kind of tricky. Because what you don't want to do is just retry in a loop. So this is in the case where your, where your microservice is trying to talk to another microservice, and um, it gets an error for some reason. So it needs to be able to retry. But you don't want to just retry in a loop as fast as you can, uh, because you will, get, um, uh, you will end up uh, inadvertently DDoSing your other services. You will overload them with traffic. Um, so you need to retry carefully. You need to do an, what's known as an exponential back off. Um, and, but actually, just an exponential back off on its own, where you like to wait for, let's say, 100 milliseconds, and then 200 milliseconds, and then 400 milliseconds, that in itself can, can lead to a problem called the thundering herd problem, where if one of your services goes down, everyone retries at exactly the same interval. And so you actually need to add some jitter to these retries. And so um, the problem with this is that it's hard to get right and you end up re recreating the same logic across all of your microservices. 
Then you set up, then you need to set up a load balancer to send traffic to the right place. Uh, you might have different policies. You might want to be able to do different types of rollouts. Um, and so um, having these lo this load balancing baked in um, to your uh, to your application is something that we do see sometimes that the, you have something like a smart client and the client depend knows where to send requests depending on various policies. And then of course you need authentication and authorization. That's just fundamental to pretty much every application. Um, then you might get really fancy and do something like circuit breaking, uh, which is this idea from Netflix where um, if uh, if a component is bad, then you sort of break it off. Um, uh, you you turn off requests to it if if it exceeds a certain error rate, um, and then you maybe try turning those requests back on later. And then of course, you also bake uh, instrumentation into your services. Uh, so for example, if you have a Prometheus client library, if you're using Prometheus for monitoring, which which we recommend um, because it's awesome. Um, then uh, you'll end up instrumenting your application code um, with, uh, with the client libraries for, for Prometheus. And the client libraries for Prometheus vary in quality. Uh, some of them are awesome. Some of them have a little bit left to be desired. And so it depends on which language you're using as to whether you have a really good time with that. So why am I talking about all of this? The reason I'm talking about all of these things that your app normally does is that service meshes say, move all of this functionality into a sidecar. Put this in a container that you sit next to your application container and let the service mesh proxy do the work. So I'll sh I drew some pictures earlier. Um, so uh, here's a picture of a Kubernetes pod. Uh, it doesn't have anything in it yet. And then what you would normally have is you have your application container and your application container has the TLS server and it has client retry logic and it has metrics and all those other things that I talked about baked in. Um, and you have requests coming in to the server side component of, of your microservice, and you have uh, requests going out um, of the client part of your microservice. Um, and what Istio says, and what service meshes say, is you should just add Istio to your Kubernetes pods, and then Istio will deal with all of the complexity involved there. And because it sees all of the requests, it's basically just a proxy. Um, because it sees all of the requests coming in and out, it's then able to provide automatic metrics uh, for those requests. And I think that's pretty cool. It means that um, you can do it once. You can, you can build all of this functionality once, or even you don't even have to build it because Istio's built it for you. Um, you can do it once well uh, in this sidecar container, and this saves you a bunch of effort. And what's more, um, especially uh, if you're building, well, what, however big your organization is, you may well have microservices that make up an application written in different languages. And these microservices are in different languages is, is called being polyglot. Um, in, in other words, there's more than one language being spoken, um, or, or at least more than one language that your microservices are written in. Um, and it's a pain to have to rewrite all of that logic that we just talked about in n different languages. Um, so, because, um, because Istio integrates at the container level, you run a container next to your application container that can be written in any, lang any, in any language, and because it, it just proxies API requests, Istio is just written in one language. It's written in a combination of Golang and C++, I think. Um, and, um, and that means that uh, you manage to implement all of this logic really well just once. Um, and then you can use it uh, against application containers that are written in, in many different languages. And they all inherit the same benefits in the same way. Um, there are some different components in Istio. Uh, there's a thing called uh, Envoy, um, and that is the smart reverse proxy that we showed in this picture. That's this thing. Um, but um, additionally, there's a, co a component called a mixer, and that's really like a sort of control service. And then there's some other components. I don't know Istio super well. Um, but there's also a component called the pilot and a component called Istio auth. Uh, pilot sends out config, apparently, according to the diagram, and Istio auth is used for distributing TLS certificates, which in itself is an interesting problem because uh, you have to be able to do certificate rotation, um, and you need to be able to uh, get different certificates sent out to different places. So um, so it's, it's pretty sophisticated. Um, this is the architecture diagram, which hopefully now, based on my previous explanation, will make a little bit more sense. Um, so there's the mixer, which is like this control plane. 
component. There's the, uh, the, the manager, which sends out config data. Um, and then there's this uh, component called Istio Auth, which, which sends out TLS certificates. Then you've got the actual application components. Um, Istio supports HTTP 1, 1.1, uh, HTTP 2, uh, gRPC, uh, and TCP with or without TLS. The nice thing about um, that is that the service itself, the service A or service B, doesn't actually need to talk CLS because Istio does that for you. And then the requests come in, they go through on through Envoy, um, and then uh, requests can come in to the service, and requests that the service makes also go out through Envoy. So, so Envoy is a proxy both for incoming and outgoing connections, which is kind of interesting. Um, and that's why it's called a mesh, because these envoys uh, form this mesh between the different components. Um, and then Envoy or Envoy uh, can also do policy checks and telemetry. That's what I meant by metrics uh, when I said that earlier. So, um, so, so really, that's what the, the Istio architecture looks like. Um, I'll pause there because uh, I think there are some questions. Um, one question is, how about Linkerd? Great question. Um, so. I'm not sure. Does anyone else on the call have a good answer to that? I know a little bit about Linkerd. Um, so, um, so I think that Envoy. Um, <laughs> so, well, one one person has said Linkerd is fat. I wasn't going to say that, um, but um, yeah, my 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 understanding is um, that um, uh, that Istio does a little bit more than Linkerd. Um, they are uh, fairly similar, um, but yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Istio has has more features than Linkerd. Linkerd is mostly about um, about ingress, which is just the idea that um, uh, that you can sort of have a uh, a reverse proxy. Um, you can have one one reverse proxy in your cluster, and then uh, depending on on configuration, like um, things like uh, vhosts, for example, then um, you can. Um, um, send all traffic for like app1.com to one set of containers and traffic for app2.com to a different set of containers. Uh, so that's sort of this idea of ingress. Now, um, I think I actually don't even know if Istio does vhost based routing or routing. So, so I think they may be slightly different beasts. Um, I hope that I hope that answers the question. Um, the question here. Uh, from Sanjeev, so is Istio primarily an aid for developers, or does the ops team also have something to gain from Istio or any service mesh? Um, and uh, the answer to that is, well, so it's I think it's an aid for the entire organization. Um, the developers definitely get a benefit from it uh, because they have to write less code. Uh, but I think the ops team would also appreciate the fact that you can do things like um, sort of uh, fleet-wide policy and authentication and authorization um, through a single control plane rather than having to, uh, for example, the security team having to worry about that being implemented in the right way um, in every different place. Um, cool. So we've got another question here. Um, sounds interesting. Would that work with microservice applications that communicate with RPC and persistent or long-lived connections between those services? Um, yeah, I don't see why not. Um, it says TCP on this slide, <laughs> so I believe that um, uh, that any TCP connection should uh, should work. I don't see anything in the architecture that would uh, that would forbid long-lived connections from also being proxied appropriately with with uh, with Envoy and Istio. Um, so yeah, any other questions? Oh, and some someone else has said that IP-based routing is coming. Um, so I'm guessing that maybe also means vhost. Based routing. Okay, another question. Uh, this is cool. Um, how does Istio intersect with CNI level networking? Um, they are really they are really running at different levels. Um, so you would use uh, so CNI networking for anyone who doesn't know is uh, the container network interface that's built into Kubernetes. Um, the container network interface basically allows pods to have IP addresses um, and um, Istio depends on that, uh, so so yeah, um, uh, you get sort of layer two, level, layer three networking um, with CNI uh, with things like WeaveNet, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and um, and something like Istio 
operates at layer seven. So, um, uh, and in fact, sort of above layer seven, really, because it in involves these higher level concepts like policy uh, and metrics. So, um, yeah, you would use um, Istio with a CNI network like WeaveNet. Uh, and uh, the Linkerd team are working on Istio integration. So awesome. That's, uh, that's great. Cool. Um, OK, so I'm going to show a quick demo now. Um, in fact, I'm going to tell you about our product a little bit more. Um, so Istio works great with Weave Cloud. Um, and there's two reasons for that. Um, the Weave Cloud is the thing I described earlier that helps you go around the loop of the software development lifecycle loop faster. Um, so uh, Weave, Cloud's ex Weave, ha Weave Cloud has two features that it has three main features, but two of them help you with with respect to Istio, and actually the third one we're looking at doing an integration. So um, the Weave Cloud Explore feature uh, shows you like a live map of your application and shows you how everything is talking to everything else, um, and I'll show you how that can be useful for understanding what Istio has done. Uh, so you can sort of look at your app without Istio and look at it with Istio, and you can see the difference. Um, and then also Weave Cloud has this uh, Prometheus monitoring as a service built into it. Um, so you can take advantage of the long-term storage of our Prometheus hosting, um, or our hosted Prometheus, I mean, um, and ship all of your Istio-generated metrics up to Weave Cloud, um, and then you don't have to worry about storing them. So we've basically solved the storage problem for Prometheus, which is, which is pretty nice. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to uh, move over here, and I'm going to cheat. I'm sorry, I'm going to just play a, a video um, because I'm a bit short on time. Um, but um, yeah, I'll just hit play. So what we have here is the sample application from Istio, uh, from Istio's website that has a product page. Oh, and uh, what we saw there was this is the sample application um, before we've applied Istio to it. And so you can see the product page um, service is talking to the review service and the rating service and so on. Um, and then uh, we, can, uh, we can apply Istio to it very, very easily. Uh, we do that um, just by uh, using that cube inject script that you just saw for a second there. Um, and then this is what your application looks like with Istio. Basically, there's a lot more stuff connected. And you'll notice that whereas, uh, well, you'll see here, for example, that the Istio mixer um, all of the different services are going and talking to the Istio mixer. Um, and um, also, if you look at the containers that are in each of these uh, pods, you can now see that there's the product page container um, and the proxy container. And if you look at the proxy container, uh, then you can see that that's running Envoy. Um, so um, additionally, we can go into the monitoring interface uh, in Weave Cloud, and we can go and uh, look at the... Um, at the different uh, metrics that Istio is providing. Uh, let me just uh, go back to that for a second. Um, I went really, really fast in this demo. Um, so uh, we can see here, for example, the request count is one of the built-in metrics uh, that Istio shows you. And so we can just look at the rate of change um, of the requests uh, in the system. Uh, and we can look at the different things. And we can then also plug that into uh, the Grafana dashboard that you get from Istio, um, because uh, Weave Cloud uh, exposes the Prometheus API, and so you can literally just plug um, uh, the same Grafana dashboard that would you, you would use to monitor Istio normally. Uh, you can just plug that directly into Weave Cloud, uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then there's um, yeah, just a, a note that uh, that's available um, on our website. Um, so let me uh, just um, just a second. Um, I'm going to uh, oops. I want to show you all my emails. Um, then um, I can also show you that on uh, on our website if you're interested in trying this yourself. Um, then. If you just search for Istio here, uh, then we have a tutorial on Istio with Weave Cloud uh, that you can follow along at home. Uh, and I'll paste this into the chat. Um, this tutorial uses GKE, for example, um, and um, takes you through uh, configuring that and then and then trying out the um, uh, the demo. So you can see exactly the same thing that uh, that I just showed you in the video. So uh, I'll paste that here.
And uh, yeah, any questions about the Istio Weave Cloud integration? OK, so um, question here. I have some pods in Kubernetes. Um, and we're, sorry, I have some pods in Kubernetes and some other REST API publicly hosted with a third party. Can those endpoints with Kube services be secured with Istio Auth or Istio Security? Um, so Istio is typically intended for use within a cluster. Um, so um, however, I think you would get all of the edge benefits, as in all of the benefits uh, of outbound retries, for example, from, Ist from an Istio-enabled application to an external uh, REST, REST server. And actually, if you control both of these sets of servers, so if you control the pods in Kubernetes and you control uh, the REST API, I think there's nothing stopping you running um, uh, Envoy, for example, on your non Kubernetesified pieces. It would just be a little bit more uh, manual configuration. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Any other questions? OK, so we're halfway through, which is good. Um, oh, yeah, so one other comment. Uh, so stop in general, introduce proxy in between. Yes, yes, that's, that's really, if you, if you remember one thing from this, it's Istio is mostly a proxy. Um, and the proxy allows you to do all sorts of funky things that you then don't have to do yourself. Uh, what's the performance policy or performance impact? Um, the um, so uh, Envoy is the tool um, that uh, is the proxy component. I really should rename this Envoy. Actually, um, the um, uh, the good thing about Envoy is that it's been used in production at Lyft. Um, you know that uh, ride sharing company um, that you might have heard of, um, and uh, and Lyft um, used it in production. And um, this approach is also used in production at Google. So um, every single request that you make to Google goes through a system a lot like this. And every single request uh, you make if you use Lyft um, on your phone, for example, uh, goes, goes through this exact system, um, Envoy at least, which is on the data path. So it's, it's performance critical. Uh, it's written in C++, and it's very, very quick. Uh, it's also a, a production-ready, stable piece of software. So, um, I don't have exact numbers, but I do know that some very big companies uh, use it uh, for uh, very big deployments. So it's probably um, appropriate for pretty much anything you can throw at it. Um, and yes, it does indeed enhance the events, and it does retry, yes. Um, and it enhances the API calls, uh, for example, by uh, doing TLS termination for you or for doing client-side retries and that sort of thing. Could you selectively apply it to special selectors? Yes, I believe so. Um, I, so the, the demo that I just showed um, uses this uh, Istio inject tool. Sorry, the cube inject tool, um, where this is part of the Istio config. So if you do bin slash Istio cuddle uh, cube inject minus f, what this does is it takes this uh, book info YAML um, and it applies uh, the Istio um, sidecar containers inside all of its pods. Um, so the nice thing about that is if you have some existing Kubernetes YAML, you can just enable Istio in all of that YAML by, by sort of piping it through this kubeinject script. Um, but of course, if you don't want to apply it to some things, then you can just uh, not do that. So you could run this uh, cube inject script yourself manually, for example, and then uh, only apply the diff to certain uh, certain pieces. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, yes, and that's correct. That Istio. Um, so one of the questions was that the, none of the microservices have to be Istio aware. Um, it's all based on source and destination of traffic. Um, Correct. Um, it's not. It's not exactly based on the source and destination of the traffic. It's really based on 
um, just whether the thing that you're talking from or the thing that you're talking to has Istio in it, like Istio enabled in it. Um, so the service discovery, for example, that you have in a Kubernetes cluster will stay the same. You'll still use DNS for service discovery, probably. Um, and um, uh, But um, your actual application doesn't have to be Istio aware, um, because in order to enable Istio, you just have to run this uh, cube inject uh, script on it. Um, so another question, loads of questions. This is awesome. Um, does this remove the idea of using Calico or WeaveNet? No, it does not. Um, so just as uh, just per one of the previous comments, um, it's not. Uh, it's uh, this. This is kind of a layer seven proxy, so it sits on top of uh, WeaveNet um, and uh, and similar projects um, and provides additional functionality at, at layer seven in the stack rather than layer two. Uh, and I talk about layer seven and layer two in a minute in my other presentation, so. Uh, I won't explain more about what I mean by that now. Um, relationship, if any, between this and an API gateway, uh, e.g. Kong. I don't know Kong um, itself, um, but um, I think it's probably fair to say that Istio is an API gateway, um, or at least that it acts like one. But it might be that there are people on the call who are more knowledgeable about that in particular than I am, so please feel free to shout. Um, would it make sense to try and ist integrate Istio with some of the networking technologies so it's all part of one solution? Personally, I think it wouldn't, um, just because they do different jobs. And I like the Unix philosophy of each tool should do one thing well. But they compose really nicely, because they all just use standard networking and standard concepts like pods and containers. Um, but where it would make sense, I think, to integrate Istio, to integrate with Istio is um, is actually with uh, a continuous delivery tool. Um, so for example, if you have a continuous delivery tool, like the one that we have built into Weave Cloud, um, which is called Weave Flux, um, then uh, the benefit that you get from, uh, then the benefit that you could get from doing an integration, which is something we're looking at, um, would be that um, one of the things that Istio does, which I haven't really talked about very much, is that it can allow you uh, to, um, to send different percentages of so different amounts of your different ratios of your traffic to different um, uh, different services or different versions of services. So here, for example, we have uh, uh, two versions of this. I mean, you can see here in this uh, in this product page example um, that we have two reviews services. We have v1 and v2. Um, so um, the you can see by default these requests are going to the v2 version. Um, but then I think uh, when we enable Istio, we're sending some requests to v1 and some requests to v2. And so you can do this sort of smart uh, proxying. And Envoy supports doing um, uh, sending requests to different places depending on things like different, um, um, uh, different values in, uh, in the HTTP headers, if you're using HTTP as the transport. Um, or different users can get directed to different versions of things. Um, so, um, so yeah, exactly. It's very useful in A-B testing. And where it could relate to a continuous delivery tool is that a continuous delivery tool might give you different policies uh, for um, how, you, uh, how you release new versions of things. So you might have a policy. Um, and we don't do this yet, but we want to. Uh, different, you might have a policy for do a canary deploy, for example. So start by but basically roll out two versions of things in parallel in production and then start start by sending 10% of the traffic or 1% of the traffic to the new version of the service and monitor the error rate. Um, and, um, uh, and then you might even see uh, that the error rate increases and then you might want to roll back the deployment uh, before you roll it out to all of your users. Um, or you might see that the error rate remains stable and performance is good, and so you can you finish the rollout and you roll it out to to everyone. Um, so uh, that's one use case, and that would exactly be useful in sort of A/B testing, or they call them uh, red green, I think, or green blue, green blue green. That's the one. Blue green deploys, um, which which might also be helpful. Um, cool. So I think we've run out of questions. Anyone else want to throw more questions at me? OK, so 
I'm I'm really glad that we had lots of interest in Istio because I think it's a really cool project. Um, and um, yeah, we're uh, like I said, we're working closely with the with the Istio team um, on on further integrations and things that will I think be very interesting in the future. Um, so I do have another presentation, which I will do uh, probably as much as I can of uh, in the remaining 20 minutes or so. Um, I, uh, I suspect that I won't get as far as the demo. Oh, sorry, there was an unanswered question. So how does the east-west load balancing of Istio relate or not with the east-west load balancing of the networking plugin? So I'm not familiar with east-west load balancing of networking plugins, so I'm afraid I can't really answer that question. Um, but um, typically what you see is that you have one container network per cluster, per Kubernetes cluster, for example, and that one Kubernetes cluster does not span uh, multiple regions um, because it depends on etcd, and etcd doesn't cope well with network partitions. Um, so the way that you see Kubernetes typically approaching this kind of east-west setup um, is that you would have um, uh, your east would be one cluster and your west would be a totally separate cluster, um, but, um, your, uh, but you would federate those clusters. So you would have um, a federation control plane maybe running somewhere else. Um, and then uh, you might want to, uh, to be able to configure um, uh, something like um, a load balancer or possibly uh, something like Istio um, to, to send traffic to different clusters depending on, depending on a policy. Um, so again, if people in the audience are more familiar with, uh, with that particular topic than I am, please, please shout out and, and make any comments. Um, I'm now going to talk about network security and network policy, um, which are at a different level, different layer of the stack uh, compared to, uh, to compared to a service mesh. So um, I'll talk about uh, what container networking is. Um, I'll talk about uh, WeaveNet in particular, which is one of our projects. Um, I'll talk about encryption and performance, um, and then I'll look at WeaveNet as a use case. Um, I'll talk about network policy, and um, then I'll give an example. I actually don't think I'm going to have time to do the demo, so let's just assume that I won't do that for now. Um, so we've learned about service meshes. Um, they operate sort of assuming that pods can talk to each other. Um, but container networking is how do pods talk to each other? But before I talk about that in more detail, um, let's just go back to basics for a minute. Uh, let's talk about what is networking. So um, anyone who's uh, sort of done a university course or anything on networking is probably familiar with this stack. Um, it's this uh, sort of seven level stack. Uh, in practice, there's only really four of the seven levels that we really need to think about uh, as practitioners. Um, there's sort of the level layer two, which is where your packets are getting sent around sort of one level up from, uh, from physical infrastructure, like, uh, like the Cat6 Ethernet cable that you plug in between your uh, between your switches and your servers, or um, the uh, 80211 frames that are flying over the radio waves, uh, for example, with me being able to present this to you over my home Wi-Fi connection. Um, then a level uh, up from that um, is, is IP. Uh, that's where things have IP addresses, IPv4 addresses, for example, and they can be routed over the public internet. Uh, on top of IP, uh, where, where IP sends datagrams, uh, you have TCP connections and UDP datagrams. Uh, TCP makes things reliable. UDP is more for uh, connectionless things where, um, for example, this video call is being streamed over UDP because if my router drops a couple of packets, it's not worth resending them because it's more important that it gets on to, uh, to sending the, what I'm actually talking about right now. And then on top of that, there's HTTP, um, which is a, a protocol um, uh, that's more like um, uh, an application level protocol or something like gRPC, uh, which is a more sophisticated version of, of, of HTTP. Um, and this level is where your actual services would talk to each other, or in particular, uh, where Istio would be running. Istio would be sitting um, 
sort of on top of a TCP connection, on binding on a TCP port, or making outgoing TCP connections, probably. Um, and uh, so you could think of Istio as just sitting on top of layer 4, providing a layer 7 proxying um, and, and routing. Um, so before we had containers, uh, we basically just had something that approximated level 2 connectivity between VMs. And so the idea was that each virtual machine has its own IP address, um, and they can send uh, packets to each other. Um, and um, when we add containers into the mix, um, this gets a little bit more complicated, um, because uh, the original Docker model, um, and I'll, I'll take a sip out of my glass, which has a Docker logo on it by chance. Um, the, the original Docker model um, uh, says something like, uh, run uh, a web server on port 80, um, uh, and the, the, the web server will actually be running on port 8080 inside the container, but, but expose it on port 80 to the rest of the world. Um, and that's OK. Um, uh, the way that it works is that you have um, a container um, uh, has its own virtual Ethernet um, uh, sort of thing. Uh, this is a virtual um, Ethernet um, uh, device running inside that, that appears inside the container. Then um, on the outside of the VM, you have what looks like a, a real Ethernet interface. Um, and then in between these two, we have what's called the Docker bridge. And the Docker bridge uh, uses network address translation to send uh, requests that come in from the outside world, excuse me, into, um, into the container. Um, we then um, additionally have the problem that if there's something inside this container and it wants to maybe go and talk to MySQL that we're running on port 3306 on this other machine, um, it, the, the connection, so for one thing, the container needs to know that MySQL's running on this machine, so it needs to know, go and talk to 10.0.0.2 as a machine. Um, but it then also sort of goes through this, um, uh, it goes through that NAT again in order to get through to another service somewhere else. Um, and this is actually kind of a bit rubbish. I mean, it was great at first when Docker was new, um, and we were still figuring out how to do everything. Um, but the new model that's used both by um, CNI, which is the Kubernetes networking interface, and also by the uh, Docker overlay network um, that's called libnetwork, is um, to really elevate the baseline um, from level two to level three in the model. Um, and what that means is that instead of having all of that uh, port mapping and NAT going on, we just throw that out the window, and actually we just give each container um, its own IP address. Um, and actually, when I say that, I, I mean in Kubernetes, I mean give each pod its own, its own IP address, because that's how Kubernetes works. Um, but in Docker Swarm, for example, you just get an IP address per container. Um, and additionally, there's this concept of services, which is a way of aggregating requests that come into, for example, API um, to have to come into a service VIP and then get distributed out to uh, uh, to pod IPs, for example, that that are running uh, actual services. So now you can have container two uh, wants to go and talk to API, whatever that is, um, and it uh, looks up uh, API in DNS and gets the service VIP. And that service bit uh, can then map onto uh, multiple instances of the service that are running inside these containers or pods. And of course, if you're running Istio, then you can then have Istio running alongside your actual application in that pod. And then there's a further hop where the request goes from the container, um, sorry, from the service bit uh, into Istio and then from Istio into the pod. So that is really the whole picture of what's going on when you run Istio. Um, in your Kubernetes cluster, for example, um, and, uh, and, and do a, a lookup for, an, for, an, for a service. Um, so the job of container networking is then to answer the question, how do you actually provide connectivity between hosts when each container needs its own IP address? And more importantly, how can you do that across any environment, any cloud, any bare metal, um, anywhere that you're, that you're running the system? Um, and there are two ways of doing that. Um, there's a way that's called an underlay, uh, which sort of relies on um, a programmable fabric. Um, 
And that's where the infrastructure as a service, so something like AWS, for example, does the, the routing. Uh, Kubernetes supports this with GCE and AWS, where basically the cluster programs the infrastructure directly to say, send all of the traffic to this IP range uh, to this specific VM, or um, uh, send all the traffic for this other IP range to this other VM. Um, and then some people like to say that in this model, container networking is just networking. And I think that's, that, that's a valid point when you are just using the underlay and you're programming the underlay. Um, but there are some limitations to this approach. It limits the number of routes that you have per host. Uh, your network then becomes typically limited to one region. Um, and that makes it hard to do cross or hybrid cloud. Um, because like I said, these clusters depend on um, uh, or, these, or these networks within these clusters um, uh, they typically don't span multiple regions. The alternative uh, is something that we um, at Weave encourage people to think about, uh, which is an overlay network, uh, which is something like WeaveNet. And the idea with an overlay network is that it encapsulates these layer two frames um, that, are, that, are in, that are running here. Oh, I didn't really show you this diagram. So yeah, when I, this is sort of the regular diagram we saw before. When, so, so what I was saying was, that in this model, networking, container networking is just is networking, is just networking. Um, whereas in this overlay model, you sort of encapsulate layer two, Ethernet, IP, and TCP, and you run it on top of actually UDP traffic um, that goes on top of the, uh, the network that is running on the VMs, for example, on, on AWS. Um, so it's a network on top of a network uh, in, a, in, very, in a very real sense. Um, and um, so WeaveNet, for example, provides a flat layer two network. Um, so you can think of it like a virtual switch. Um, and the thing that it does, I think, is really clever. It, it, it connects um, the layer two network uh, frames that, uh, that are exposed up here to the application uh, back into the Linux kernel sort of via this sort of almost sort of loop that you can imagine connecting these, these so-called Ethernet frames uh, to uh, back into UDP frames that then get back over IP and get back over Ethernet again. Um, and that means that actually all the stuff in Linux that does networking just works. So all of the um, stuff like ARP, which is how uh, the address resolution protocol, which is how things find each other based on MAC address, uh, that actually just all works over this virtual network. Um, and that means that an overlay network can run anywhere. Uh, all you need is UDP. Uh, between hosts, and you can even then create virtual networks that span multiple clusters, and that even works if you have one cluster that's behind uh, NAT, for example, it's behind your corporate firewall, and another cluster um, that is um, uh, that is in a cloud, for example. And WeaveNet then also deals with allocating IP addresses for you, um, and it does that using uh, by implementing the container network interface that uh, that we saw uh, that we saw earlier. And so this picture here. Um, is the picture where you might have uh, multiple clusters uh, in multiple data centers. So if you are interested in, in this cross-cloud uh, use case, then um, well, come and chat to us on Slack, and, and we'd be interested in helping you out uh, getting it set up. Um, so one objection that you typically hear raised about overlay networks is, well, isn't that a bit slow? Um, and actually, it's not that slow. Um, we did some, uh, some benchmarking using WeaveNet uh, versus uh, native networking on AWS. Uh, we got some pretty beefy boxes, some C3 ATEX lodges. Uh, you can sort of tell when we did this. It was probably last year because it was before C4s came out. Um, and you can see the graph here. Um, we're within 89% uh, of native performance. Uh, so for most applications, this doesn't matter. And it gives you this additional flexibility. That is assuming that WeaveNet is running in what's called fast data path mode, this fast DP mode versus sleeve where it has to uh, go, go uh, where, it, where it isn't as fast. Um, and I'll talk about uh, sleeve versus fast data path in a second. I think I have a diagram about that. Um, so just a little bit more about WeaveNet. Um, it has um, a control plane which uses gossip and CRDTs. Um, those are two very cool pieces of technology. Um, gossip is the idea that you can form, um, you can basically get useful work done without necessarily having consensus. Uh, this is really important because 
the network doesn't always uh, help you. Um, there are often network partitions in real life, and you want something as fundamental as your network to carry on working in the face of network partitions. Um, so uh, gossip uh, is basically the idea that you can have different nodes in the network just send each other messages and get useful work done by gossiping information to each other and having that information spread between different nodes in the network. And uh, CRDTs are this, uh, this idea of conflict-free re uh, replicated data types. Um, and and conflict-free replicated data types basically mean that you can gossip these, uh, this information around, and even if you have a network partition and then you recover afterwards, your data type allows you to do things like always merging information back um, to be able to cope with network partitions. Uh, and we like to say that, um, uh, that this allows you to, um, uh, to really have your network operate in the same way that the internet works, uh, because the internet also uh, has partitions and carries on working uh, when, there's, uh, when there are partitions and, uh, and so on. Um, WeaveNet only requires consensus in the control plane when it's initially allocating IPAM ranges, and it uses a simplified version of Paxos to do that. And then once it's done that, once it's done that initial um, consensus phase, uh, it will just carry on uh, working even on, in the face of network partitions. The data path then uh, has these two different modes. It has the fast data path mode, uh, which uses VXLAN, uh, which are uh, in-kernel um, encapsulation of Ethernet frames over UDP. And that's really, really blindingly quick. Um, and uh, then it has this fallback mode, which it can do if it can't set up a VXLAN tunnel for some reason, uh, which uses the same library as Wireshark, um, which is called libpcap to do packet sniffing, basically. And it simulates the same um, uh, encapsulation, but just um, uh, just in uh, user space. And uh, WeaveNet also supports the data path for AWS VPC in, in case you, you actually just want to thunk down to, uh, uh, directly to, to the fabric. Um, and so this, this idea of fast data path is really this idea that instead of having to go from a user's application into the kernel, back on, into user space, uh, into the router, the Weave router, and then back out into the network and then back in again and, and so on, uh, instead, you can go uh, to this OVS module, which is part of the Linux kernel. And the Weave router actually is then just responsible for sort of programming the kernel. Um, and um, so uh, as of uh, WeaveNet 1.9, you can now have both fast and secure, uh, because we added um, IPsec support to our uh, VXLAN-based uh, fast data path. Um, I'm just uh, trying to figure out how much more uh, to talk about here, because we've got about five minutes left, and I want to make sure that we leave time for questions. Um, if people have questions, um, why don't you just put them in the chat, and then um, I can stop when I think I've run out of time. Yes, so in fact, there is one. OK, cool. So where is SNAT uh, performed for traffic going south to north out of the cluster? Is it done on every host's IP tables or a separate NAT gateway? Um, I presume you're asking that question regarding um, this sort of old model um, that I described. Um, and uh, the short version is that we shouldn't be using this old model anymore, so we shouldn't actually have NAT. Um, there shouldn't be much NAT going on uh, between machines or, or between, between containers. Um, in, in a modern sort of Kubernetes cluster or a Docker Swarm cluster. Um, even the new model requires traffic going north. Um, so, yeah, um, the, I suppose there is uh, some network address translation going on in this, in this service VIP here, actually. So that's a very good point. Um, and yes, I'll, I'll share the slides. Um, so um, the, um, uh, there is definitely network address translation now that I think about it going from here, um, from this container to the AP API, and then into the service VIP, and then back out into the containers. Um, and yeah, Kubernetes uh, does that, sets that up automatically for you uh, in kubeproxy, which basically just programs IP tables. Um, so yeah, even in the new model, um, there is some natting. 
Um, and the question was, where is it performed? Um, is it done on every host IP tables? It's done on every host IP tables, yes. Yeah. So there isn't a separate NAT gateway um, in any of these systems, as far as I understand it. Um, and that's nice, because it means that you don't have another component that could fail that you then need to tolerate the failure of. Um, IP tables is pretty good at doing that sort of thing. Um, cool. Any other questions? Um, OK. Um, I think it's probably not worth going through much more of the talk. Um, and also, my computer's being incredibly slow, maybe because it's very hot here in London. Um, but we will definitely get a link to the video to share with the rest of the team, uh, with, with, with the rest of your team and, and anyone else. Um, and um, yeah, there's also more content in here um, about, uh, about um, Kubernetes security policy. Uh, so I'm just going to skip through the slides. Um, this is based on a, a talk that my colleague Brian Borum did. Uh, which we can also share the link to in a follow-up. He did a very, very nice talk about this, um, and uh, he does a better job of it than me. Um, and there's also, if you want to try the demos that I was going to show you, um, they're available on our website. So for example, um, this uh, network policy demo is available, um, and I would encourage people uh, to check it out. Um, it's uh, a catacoder, which means that you can run through it entirely in your own browser, um, and you get a, a temporary Kubernetes cluster. So that's pretty cool. Uh, please check it out. And then the last thing I'll say is um, please come and join our user group. If you're not already a member of the user group on meetup.com slash pro slash weave, um, and um, also come and hang out on Slack with us. We love chatting to people on Slack. Um, so there's the meetup group, um, and here's the, uh, the link to the Slack channel. So uh, yeah, I can close that out with um, our slide. And um, just to share with people here, you will get a follow-up email um, after this event. So you should have access to the video before it is um, published uh, through our blog post and then even later through um, YouTube. So if you have attended, then you should receive an email and you'll be able to get that link before um, anybody else. So again, thank you so much for joining. And please come to our uh, next user groups. And uh, we'll see you then. Awesome. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye. Bye.